work the slide the the slide share is it working or is it still the same problem yeah, yeah you can see the first slide, slide. Yeah. okay great okay yes. so uh, this is where we are today we we had uh, that wonderful presentation on the history by narish narsimhan and a what is it a systems assets overview uh, by nagesh um, and so i'm going to talk about uh, the water cycle and its management actually let me turn let me turn my video on So full screen is still there, right? Yeah. Hi. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Danush, since I'm not paying attention, you're going to have to pay attention to who's in the waiting room and admit people. Oh, now yeah. Sure. Danush will have to. All right. Okay. So uh, there's a whole bunch of questions that uh, Nagesh uh, had uh, set out for me in terms of. Um, uh, in terms of what we want to, the topics we want to cover and the questions we want to get answered um, in this first session so the water cycle what water management paradigms exist and then how do we make choices so i'll kind of go over this one by one uh, it's I, it's fairly basic but at the same time if you've never seen any of it before it's a lot to absorb so my suggestion is that um I can't unfortunately see the chat box. So maybe one other thing I'm going to do is to do it on my phone as well so that uh, I can see questions as they come up. Um, just give me one more second. Let me also do, do that so that um, I can monitor the chat box. Um, okay, so the first thing that I'd like to talk about is one of the reasons we have a lot of difficulty is um, one of the reasons we have a lot of difficulty is because the different agencies and the different um, groups involved tend to look at Bangalore's water and wastewater system in very different ways. Um, some of them um, will look only at the, the, the water wastewater part of it, which is the typical way that uh, wastewater utilities uh, deal with it, water and wastewater utilities. Um, the BPMP will tend to look at it in a different way and so on. So BWSSB's view of Bangalore's water system is, uh, is this. Basically, you get water from uh, a reservoir. In this case, it's primarily from the Kaveri. It goes to water treatment plants, through the pipe network, to um, urban residents. And then uh, they, in, uh, in turn, release sewage, which goes through an underground sewage network, through a sewage treatment plant. Now, some parts of the city, they acknowledge may be getting water supply, but not yet be this word, in which case they are served, or they are served by septic tanks and uh, a honeysuckle network, which is supposed to take the septic tanks to a fecal sludge plant and uh, treat it. Now, this is the idealized version, obviously. This is not, all of us know that this is not exactly how Bangalore's water and wastewater system looks today, but this is the idealized version of the conceptualization of how BWSSB sees it. So they only will see the components of the system that matter to them, right? Um, and uh, on the other hand, BBMP's view of the system is very different. If you see which components of the system does BBMP care about, well, they care about the land, they care about the parks, they care about the, the Rajakalways and the, and the lakes, and uh, those, uh, in fact, go and join the river at some point. So uh, BBMP's view of the system looks very different from BWSSB's, and it is concerned primarily with paving, with, with uh, flooding, with, uh, with the channels, with the lakes, with the actual physical land assets itself. Um, now, all of us know that, of course, in reality, these two systems coexist, right? They intersect and they coexist. So you have BWSSB's pipe water and wastewater system, sits on top uh, and alongside BBMP's lakes uh, and Rajakalway system. And a, a lot of the problems that we have, and then groundwater, which is actually nobody's baby, which is why it didn't show up uh, uh, separately, is actually just hanging out there. It's a, actually a big part of our water and wastewater system. So um, the main, one of the recurring themes that we will face 
in so when we think about conceptualization is how do you untangle the fact that we as citizens have a holistic view of the system we care about all of these pieces but agencies that we must interact with are actually tasked or have jurisdiction of only some sections of the entire system and so often what happens is that it's confusing because when you speak to one agency they give you a set of numbers of a particular view but it's because they have a particular boundary or a particular jurisdiction that they are concerned with and some of the reconciliation that we have to do when we think about these alternative paradigms uh, including the kinds of visions that narishna simon presented is about connecting the dots between agencies and he used the same term when you look at it you look at it in pieces and the agencies see themselves as individual dots but the problem is it is left as us to the citizens of the city to connect those dots and that's why it ends up being so difficult um so if you look at bwssb their focus is on uh, water supply and primarily today all of our water is entirely almost coming from kaveri historically we got water from other sources like tgli reservoir and hesalgata but as those dried and why they dried is a whole story for another day but as those dried we are almost entirely or dependent on kaveri this is before the kaveri fifth state so it's as of the numbers as of two years ago when we did the primary data uh, collection um and then there's the big groundwater component which enters i mean everybody who uses a bore well and releases wastewater is using groundwater and that groundwater is interacting and and becoming part of the sewage system but it's not actually part of bwssb's official view of the system so it's important to kind of say one half of the system which is the wastewater part of it does have to account for groundwater abstraction but the water supply part of it doesn't and so this is a little bit of a inconsistency that we have to grapple with um okay what's happening do i need to uh, mute somebody yeah okay so um the second part of the system which is if you remember the bbmp side of it is about managing stormwater runoff and uh, and uh, the how stormwater runoff is managed through the system now i i i will talk about each of these separate it's good to understand each of these separately because the objectives that the agencies have are often um, uh, at conflict so bbmp's bwssb's job that's the water utilities job which is the view that we saw before um uh, is only to supply people a sufficient quantity of water and take the wastewater as quickly as possible away from the city treat it maybe give it to kolar maybe put it downstream that's a different story but that is bbm bwssb's uh, job in the entire system or at least the way they view their job um bbmp's job is to manage storm water and to manage lakes so of course as far as the lakes is concerned some of the encroachment and some of the asset management that nagesh talked about earlier that's part of their purview but a large part of it with respect to the water is actually storm water management and flood prevention and so the therefore historically the bmp and all other municipal agencies um, who have thought about these systems have tended to say that our job is only to worry about storm water and therefore if it's flood prevention my job is to get the water as quickly as possible away from the city that's kind of their the logical and best way to handle storm water is to get the get the water away from it from the city as quickly as possible and often this has conflicted with other objectives saying why can't we keep extra water to re, you know to recharge ground water why can't we keep um, extra water to um, uh, you know to to store in lakes and for recreation and all of this and so this is where some of those consistencies uh, inconsistencies begin, begin to arise and of course it's complicated and i'll explain this in a moment because watershed what we call hydrologic boundaries and political boundaries don't overlap i'll explain this concept in a minute and then i'll stop for questions uh, if people have questions so uh, again apologies to those for whom this is very obvious and basic i this was a basic class so we are assuming that people don't already understand these things so apologies for those who uh, already understand it bear with us so storm water is the water that's rain water that flows through the topography in channels what naresh called raj, raj kalaways but in general our stream and river channels storm water drains whatever you call them um and the flow and the quantum of flow that goes into a storm water drain 
is determined by the watershed boundary. What do we mean by a watershed boundary? So firstly, for people who are not familiar with this stuff, often the uh, watershed boundary, uh, people think of watersheds as somehow being fixed, that you know, there is a Arkavati watershed, there is a Rishpavati watershed. But actually, the concept of watershed is always defined with respect to a particular outlet point. That means, theoretically, there's no, nothing sacrosanct about a watershed. Historically, governments have already classified watersheds, and therefore, we refer to it as an Arkavati or a Belandur watershed. But the concept of a watershed itself is, can be defined with respect to any point in a river system. So you take a point in the river system and say, what is the land area whose rain contributes to the flow at that particular point in the system. And that is the watershed of that particular outlet point. So watersheds are always defined with respect to particular outlet points. So for example, all you're trying to say, and the only concept here is to think about if it rains on the top of a mountain, the raindrops which fall on this side are going to flow, on that, flow and go that way. The raindrops which fall on this side of the slope flow and go this way. And so everything over here, which is if you collect, you connect all the tops of the ridges, the tops of the, the topographic highs up to this point, all of the water that falls here is going to eventually collect and flow through this point. And therefore, this is the watershed with respect to this outlet point. And like I said, normally when we are discussing watersheds, we are, when we say watershed of Belandur Lake, we mean all of the watershed or all of the area whose rain contributes to flow into Belandur Lake. That is the watershed of Belandur Lake, right? So that's basically what we're talking about when we are talking about watersheds. Um, the other point I made was political boundaries and hydrological boundaries do not often coincide. Um, uh, so your ward boundaries, I just made up random squares as ward boundaries here. Imagine they are wards. They can be any way. They were made for whatever historical reasons based on urban planning and so on. Sometimes they do coincide with watershed boundaries, but often they do not. And so now what happens is the way water flows and the way you need to make water decisions is based on a watershed. And many watersheds together make a sub-basin. Many sub-basins together make a river basin, right? But the point is that your political boundaries, whether it is wards or whether it is cities or whether it's districts or villages or whatever, rarely coincide with your hydrologic boundaries. And therefore, this is one a second reason why all of your um, calculations become very complicated. But urban plan is an urban joker, Arke Mishra. What's hmm. that? No, 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 sorry. Okay. Did you, what did I say urban planner wrong? Is that, uh, is that? Hey, no, no, no. I, uh, I was actually chatting with somebody else about something else. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I've forgotten yeah. to mute. My apologies. Okay. No problem. I thought there was an urban planner protesting that I was maligning their profession. Uh, <laughs> no, no. It, it, it obviously is, right? Everybody has to. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, I don't have time to teach people how to do watershed delineation. Uh, there are, it is, firstly, the software is free. That's a good news. Uh, QGIS is a great software. There are literally thousand uh, courses that you can take on Coursera. And there are also very specific videos on how you delineate a watershed. So I think any, if you really want, to get into it, anybody can teach themselves to do it. If there really is pressing um, kind of people, and there's plenty of really excellent people in Bangalore that teach free classes on this stuff. If you really want uh, instruction, we can do it. Uh, but otherwise, I'm just going to put the link the videos as part of the, the PowerPoint and people can um, go ahead and do it themselves. So I'm going to stop here for a second um, to see if there are any questions only because um, we want to make sure that people are getting getting what they need to out of the out of the entire thing. So, are there any questions? I can't see the chat. So, let me take a look at the chat window. Hmm. Okay. Uh, somebody just needs to put up, somebody needs to answer because I can't see the chat, unfortunately, when I'm presenting. Oh, at least I haven't figured it out. All right. So let's assume that this is perfectly clear. Uh, you can also say if this is all really obvious stuff, then um, I can't see the chat. Oh, yeah. There is a chat question. Okay. Nothing. Okay. 
so if this is all really obvious stuff then you can also tell me this is all really obvious stuff um okay the next thing that we want to talk about is how the storm water flows through bangalore and this is now we are talking about the storm water as it existed historically in the kind of system that naresh talk, talked about so naresh showed you really nice photos from the field of how the system existed and also that it was designed as an overflow system if you remember the very first talk so this is how it looks hydrologically um this red point here is high grounds police station and high grounds police station is called high grounds police station because it was literally on one of the closest to the highest point um topographically in bangalore and uh, basically as i said before that when you sitting on a ridge and bangalore has multiple ridges right so that's the, the three ridges the ridges are what uh, cause um the three valleys that people talk about often uh, actually a little part of arkavati also falls into um into bangalore but the three valleys that you talk about this is the hebal so that means all the rain which falls on this side of the the northern side of this particular um ridge is going to flow into the hebal series and all of these represent topographic high points so basically if you remember from my previous topo uh, watershed i mean from my previous relief map this is the area that drains um and and leaves the city at this particular point and particular this is yellamalaba chetty kere is the last point at which uh, we count uh, it as leaving the city and so it basically drains all of the uh, hebal valley similarly you have uh, the kurmangala chelagatta valley which is which includes uh, belandur varthur and um, and um, uh, some of the lakes which are really have been in the news um and uh, this drains so basically those are all drained by these series there are and there are plenty of uh, you know information online which will tell you um, which the different sub series are and what is connected in upstream and downstream of what all of this is kind of well documented information but this is basically the kurmangala chelagatta valley um, uh, terminating in belandur and then going to varthur so belandur and then varthur and uh, the western side of it and the important thing is that bangalore rise lies in the on the peak or the top of a mountain which is very firstly one important thing to remember is very very few cities are uh, were ever historically done on mountain tops and i think naresh talked about the significance of bangalore as a military uh, cantonment and why it was important to have a fort on top of a mountain nobody imagined that you would have a city of 10 million people on top of a mountain right or uh, and so um, uh, that's unusual because almost most other cities in india are actually on uh, in river valleys whether you think of bombay or pune or chennai you'll think about you'll talk about the river that flows through the city whether whether it's banaras or andhavad or whatever it is you know but typically at the topographic lows bangalore is already unique because it's at a topographic high that means at the top of a mountain and also important to realize that the western part of bangalore this entire part is part of kaveri basin and that's why only and it's about 40% of the city which falls within kaveri basin which is why when you see discussions about the kaveri dispute they say about 40% of bangalore lies within kaveri the other 60% this these two valleys kormangala chelagatta and hebal uh, valley uh, flow into the dakshin pinakni river so two completely different different river basins means they don't even intersect they, they follow completely different pathways to the sea like a particle over here and a particle over here are never going to meet they are only going to meet in the ocean right um uh, this part of it is arkavati and this lower part is rishbavati rishbavati is a tributary to the arkavati so this river and this river will eventually meet and together flow into the kaveri become the arkavati and then flow into the kaveri um okay that's a lot of detail um but the main thing as uh, uh we heard several times before is that these lakes are connected in a cascading chain um and as people pointed out man they never necessarily conceived them uh, to be a chain, cascading chain it was you know these were local uh, structures that were built by local uh, you know local landlords local kings uh, typically they happened to connect with through the river system but they were never planned or managed historically when they were tank originally irrigation tanks it was that each village or each um, area got to um, uh, collect a certain amount of rain water and use it for their purposes for cattle for uh, drinking and for irrigation 
Um, uh, now the problem is because of the way the system is altered, and I'll see, you'll see that in uh, a couple of slides down, because of the way the system is altered, this entire thing and the need to see it as an integrated system uh, becomes really important. So this is obviously what has happened as the city has urbanized. Firstly, you had a bunch of apartment complexes. Several of you asked this already in the questions because as the sewerage network didn't keep up with the city, uh, there's a lot of um, raw sewage being dumped into the drains of the Rajkalve. So that's obviously the first uh, problem. Um, then to fix the problem, often diversion drains were created. So that means there was, there, it would be said that, okay, there's all this sewage in this main drain that used to go in here and fill this lake, but we are just going to put a diversion drain around so that it goes downstream. So these are all band-aid fixes, but they are very commonly done throughout Bangalore city that you have these diversion drains. Now with some of these, so what is a diversion drain? It's literally that they put a wall sort of between this inlet and, um, and the lake. So what will happen is that the, as long as the sewage is below the wall, it just gets diverted, flows along this channel and goes and joins back the Rajkalavi downstream. But if it rains very heavily and the water actually, uh, the water level in the channel goes above that wall, then it will flow into the lake. So there are a number of lakes in uh, Bangalore, like uh, Kaikondrali is a good example, where there are these kinds of diversion drains, uh, where um, Saurakere is another example. Uh, Hebal itself has a similar diversion drain. I mean, many lakes have them. But, uh, but the interesting thing is the diversion drains are of some of quite different heights. So if you see a lake like Saul Kere, uh, almost no water enters. You need a very, very, very large amount of rain to be able to overcome uh, that drain and enter the lake. Um, so the, the, uh, a lake like that is dry quite a bit for most part, except uh, following very heavy rains. Uh, another uh, uh, lake like Kaikondrali, though, um, it gets rain, you know, it gets uh, filled even with relatively smaller, uh, smaller storms. Uh, some of it depends on the size of the watershed relative to the lake and so on. Let's not get into that. There's a number of things which determine that. But if you look at Hebal, for example, and the kind of construction that was recently done, they made the, you know, the wall was, uh, say, um, at some height and they made them all very, very much higher. So one of the considerations that comes up when you start making these kinds of diversion drains is it determines what is the size of a rain event that is going to allow water come, to come into the lake. And so it determines how many fillings the lake will have and therefore will the lake fill up or, or dry up in summer. All of those kinds of uh, consequences um, emerge from that decision of how high that diversion drain is made. Um, the third kind of common intervention you see, and this is the example of Jakur, is a lakeside STP, where um, the STP picks up um, sewage from the underground. What they do is they manage to get their act together essentially and put the underground sewage system in one or two or three wards. And um, they ensure that all of that sewage in that area, which was going into the drain uh, and uh, into the lake, is being now diverted to an STP so that there's no raw sewage in the main drain. And in such a case, then you can put an STP uh, and the STP's treated water is then put into the lake. Yeah, so this is kind of the ways in which the system has been altered. Um, now, obviously, as I said before, uh, because the system is now an intersection of the piped water system and wastewater system, because of all these inflows of sewage into the um, stormwater system. So the way the system was designed, the ideal way is that rainwater would flow into the stormwater drains and flow into the lakes and eventually downstream into the river. That was the conceptualization. And wastewater would go into the piped water network and into the sewage treatment plants and then downstream into the river. This is the way the ideal system was uh, designed. And that is obviously not what happened. And therefore you have this uh, system of this weird kind of intersection between these two systems. And then you have groundwater, which is a whole other, um, uh, you know, wrinkle in the system, which nobody ever paid any attention to. At least nobody thinks it's part of their, you know, it's the forgotten stepchild. And all of these things now interact. Um, the one thing that I should say is that groundwater, um, I had this in a few slides before, and I think I just ran this slide, which I ran over. I forgot to talk about you have it rains, you have runoff, which happens over uh, the land, which is called quick flow. 
but water goes into the ground and you also have ground water oozing back into the stream and this is called waste flow so uh, if you think about uh, the entire system now you have uh, storm water you have ground water you have waste water and you have pipe water you have four different types of water and waste water flowing through the entire system and they are all interconnected with each other and that's what makes the system really complicated to handle now um so if you really wanted to ask the answer the very first question that nagesh gave me which is how do you figure out how much you have how much water is coming from where where is it going how do you do the water balance this is kind of i just took this previous system and i just made it a flow diagram to show what are all the uh, types of flows that you have so it goes rain water goes into obviously rain water system, harvesting systems and is used by users city users you have rain water going into uh, any dams that you may have local dams um, or it can be imported water field depending on what scale you're looking at it which is then brought to a waste water treatment is uh, brought into a water treatment plant sorry purified and then distributed through the pipe water network now one big piece of the entire thing is that our, our pipe water systems are very very leaky so almost 30% of the pipe water that comes into bangalore leaks uh, into ground water and that if you take a water balance of the city that is a huge component of recharge into the city it's almost half in in many cases um you know, people uh, iic has done this for bangalore i have personally done this for chennai uh, it ends up being a very very big part of the ground water balance um obviously households then uh, pump ground water themselves for additional use um uh, ground water is also pumped by tankers and supplied that way uh, and then you have the peri urban areas where uh, ground water is pumped um, uh, for use but the waste water because they are unsewered the waste water goes into a septic tank and the septic tank often oozes and re and goes back into the aquifer and recontaminated so i have deliberately put blue as somewhat clean water red as waste water and purple as kind of partially treated water so it's water that's you know of got some nutrients but it's not completely waste water so um, uh, how so these unsewered areas often discharge into the drains directly and this is another example that was given by uh, naresh in the morning talking about the number of illegal outlets from unsewered areas um and then uh, lakes of course evaporate they cascade through the system and flow downstream um lakes also recharge groundwater so that happens and then households discharge water the big households sometimes even in sewer areas discharge uh, untreated water directly to lakes or send them to wastewater treatment plants which in turn discharge them to lakes or downstream now so therefore i hope that if all that you got out of this and you can stare at this diagram later if all that you got out of the system is that it's a incredibly complex system and figuring out one piece without worrying about what's going to happen to all the other pieces is necessarily tricky and one of the biggest problems we have with interagency coordination is exactly that now just to go back to the water balance and saying how do we estimate some of these components the point, the thing is that we know how to measure some things and other things we know how to estimate there are standard engineering formulae you can apply to estimate the others so for example rain water you can estimate we have 100 rain gauges case and bmc alone has 100 rain gauges in bangalore so you can get somewhat of a reasonable estimate of spatial variation in rain and therefore how much fell in a particular area on a particular day you can guess that we know how much kaveri supply is coming into pwssb because that is metered of course by pwssb BWSSB is one of the rare water utilities that actually meters water, uh, even though they have uh, some unmetered connections and so on. But by and large, they know how much water is being delivered. Um, the difference between the two, um, uh, sometimes you do is you can guess how much leakage is happening into the aquifer, and then we know from intakes of wastewater treatment plants how much is being delivered to wastewater treatment plants. And then we can guess from the wastewater treatment plants internal functioning and metering how much is being discharged. back to the streams now you look at the number of arrows which we started off with and the number of arrows that we have some grip on and even those have uncertainties but at least we have measurements of um as you can tell not to win right and some of the big problems is therefore that we have huge number of unknowns 
that we have to struggle with in order to figure out what is going on in the city, how much is available, where is it going, with, of what quality, where is it ending up, you can see lots and lots and lots of question marks. We don't know evaporation from lakes, we don't know recharge from lakes. We can estimate some of these and I'll show you how, but we struggle. We don't know evapotranspiration from big, um, uh, and I wouldn't define these terms, it's there in the glossary. Evapotranspiration is just the combination of evaporation and transpiration from trees uh, is evapotranspiration. So there are large areas, green areas in, in the city like uh, Kaban Park and Lal Park where the trees are absorbing water also and putting them back into the atmosphere. So that's a big component in some parts of the city. We don't know how much is going downstream uh, to either to the Kaveri or to the Ekdarshan Binakini. We don't know how much groundwater extraction there is. Uh, we don't know how much the septage tanks are leaking. Um, we don't know how much pipeline leakage is there. We can guess, but we don't know. So there's lots of uncertainties in the system. Um, some of the ways, and this is just one example, groundwater for households is hard, but at least household water use is somewhat known. We have ranges for how much household water households use in Bangalore. And so we can kind of guess that if this is the amount of pipe water, then the remaining must be groundwater. But groundwater from commercial, CII is commercial industrial institutional. From commercial industrial institutional users, uh, we don't even know how much water their needs are. And so one of the really painful um, exercises that we've tried is to figure out who is using how much water, because how do you get at a whole water balance? So this was done by actually going and sitting in KSPCB office and very painstakingly looking industry by industry to see what fraction in different areas they were reporting as pipe water versus groundwater, then looking at how water intensive they are and reconstructing what the groundwater uses. And long and short of it, uh, commercial industry uses 80 to 90% of their water is groundwater. And so we know from that, because we know that pipe water supply is about I did somewhere around 100 MLD, I forget if it's 85 or 100 or 105, something like that. But it's in that range. We know that the groundwater must be at least three times, three to three and a half times that, right? Just from commercial industry. And then probably another 400 to 600 million liters per day. So about 300 from commercial industry, another 400 to 600 from domestic. And this is all done by painstaking calculations of saying, if this is true, then that must be true. If that is true, do I really have data on that? and so on. So I won't bore you. We will put out these reports fairly quickly, um, some of these reports, so you can start looking at the methodologies and seeing why it's so painful. But this is just to give you a flavor of it. Uh, pipeline leakage, again, it's hard. You've seen probably signs all over the city. Uh, BWSSB keeps on doing these leak, leak detection and improvement projects. Um, there's Basically, it involves putting a bunch of meters and sensors and then using models to figure out how much leakage is happening. Um, placing it at somewhere around 30% is my guess. I don't know if that number has changed uh, recently. Now, the third thing is we don't know how much water is there in lakes. So the one thing to understand about water measurement is you can measure level of water very easily. Literally, you can put a stick in the water and you can see how much the height of the, you know, if you put a long ruler in the water and see to what height uh, the water is, you can say what's the height of water. I mean, and there are a thousand other, you know, more complicated ways to measure that. Just because you know the height of water, you don't know the volume of water. Because if it's a very shallow lake, then it's got the same height has much less um, water involved. But if it's a very deep lake, meaning the shape of the lake is such, then um, for the same height of water, you may have very, very different um, volume of water. So it really, uh, I mean, so, so I don't mean shallow and deep, I should call it flat and, and um, you know, like a soup bowl. Um, so one of the things that we do then for this is we do something called bathymetry, right? And this is just an example of how we measure. So just showing you different ways that you measure. So if you look from satellite imagery, there's lots of very sophisticated ways to do it. And if for fun, you can go, go and Google Earth and you can kind of, if you um, are familiar with Google Earth, I'll show you a quick Google Earth uh, introduction for those who aren't familiar with Google Earth, but I know many of you are IT people and you have used Google Earth, you can kind of see um, the tanks from space um, and you can actually measure out how much this, what the spread area was uh, at different times. This is for one particular tank in 2014 done outside of Bangalore. Um, but just because you know the water spread area doesn't mean you know the volume. Same reason we don't know what the shape of the lake is. 
Um, other ways to do it is by measures. This is one kind of non-contact sensor, which is an ultrasonic sensor. And this is a more um, in-contact sensor. One of them, this is in Taekwondo Lake, which was installed by us. This has, um, a, one is just a tape measure that you can read. And then one of them is, a, uh, is actually a water level sensor, which is a capacitance sensor of some kind. So long and short of it, you can get area or you can get levels. But the problem is you still can't get volume. And a lot of what we do is um, uh, trying to understand how do you get volume. Now, even to know where to put measurement device, um, you need to kind of know a little bit about the lay of the uh, tank itself. So I'm going to give you an example of a tank which is outside of Bangalore. Like I said, this is Google Earth. Google Earth is a free software. You can download it. Um, again, there's literally a bazillion different uh, programs to tell you how to use it on YouTube. No mystery there. But often, um, very, very simple. And again, I apologize if all this is ridiculously basic for you people. Uh, uh, you can, if you look at Google Earth, you can, you can see the, lat the latitude and the longitude down here. Right? This is the date of the imagery. I deliberately picked the date which the imagery was clear. And this is some tank which is north of Bangalore in the Arkavati watershed, upper Arkavati watershed. Um, so um, if you look over here, you can see the elevation. Okay. Now the thing to keep in mind is elevations in Google Earth are not super accurate. They have big error margins, but they will still give you a decent sense of the lay of the land. So don't take, if you, if your application requires the elevation to be known to one centimeter, Google Earth is not your uh, software to use. But it's good enough to get a general sense of the topography. So I'm just going to hover around here. Um, can anybody confirm that they can see my, ha my hand? Can they see my uh, little icon on Google Earth? Yes, we can. Yes. Tanush? Tanush? Yes, you can. Okay. So if you look over here, you can see that the number of the elevation, I want you to watch this when I'm here. So when I'm here, it's about 763 meters. And then this is meters above mean sea level. So it's an absolute elevation. And then as you're going down, you can see that it's 755, 760, you know, it's, it's basically going, this is downstream. So we know that the, by downstream, I mean, if it's not obvious now, water always flows from high elevation to low elevation. That's just how gravity works. And so obviously, uh, water was going the direction natural gradient or direction of flow of the water is from high elevation to low elevation so if this is 763 meters and this is 757 the water is naturally going to go that way okay now often people are confused when you look at your particular lake from a satellite image which is the inlet which is the outlet google earth can kind of help you in most cases so this was 760 if you remember you can see that this is 770 um 767 768, 772, 766, and 760. So you know that this has to be, uh, this area has to be the band or the outlet. And all of these must be inlets, right? And this is an, a way for you to check also later to see that, um, to ensure that your, uh, you know, if there's a one, you know, one of the things I've heard is uh, somebody trying to build a pipeline with water supposed to go upstream, the gradient is in the wrong direction, that sort of thing. So if really ridiculous stuff is happening, this is a way that you can quickly ensure it. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you is for people who are again familiar, you can look historically at Google Earth imagery. You saw that I showed you, this is the date of this particular image, November 11, 2018. You can go back and look at other ones. And uh, you can see that in the drier period, in the end, of, you can see this is now December 2017, um, May 2017. So you can see that the tanks generally are empty in the summer months. They may not be entirely empty, but um, they are full in the just after the monsoon, not surprisingly. Okay, um, if you go keep going back, I just wanted to show you some. really dry periods. Okay, so this is a really dry period, which is May 2015. You can see the outline of the larger tank, right? And uh, what you want to notice here is that the tank is always the deepest uh, near the outlet. That's kind of how gradients of tanks work, because otherwise, if that was not the case, then 
uh, the water wouldn't even flow through the tank, right? It would just get stuck in the upstream area and then it would have another little dam in the middle that it had to overcome. So if you had to install a water level sensor, um, you would want to install it at the deepest point in the tank so that you're able to get a water measurement even when the tank dries up. And so you always want to put a water level measurement device on as close to the outlet pier as possible, right? Um, are there any questions about this? Is this kind of obvious that the inlets are always going to be shallower and upstream? The outlets are always going to be deeper and downstream. And if you have to bother measuring, then you would always make sure that you put your measurement device at the outlet. So far, so good. Is there, are there any questions here? Just a question, uh, risk of uh, vandalism or theft of the water le level measuring device, mm -hmm. uh, because all these are open areas, unmonitored many times. Yeah, um, I, in Bangalore, if the lake is rejuvenated and has a um, home guard, I haven't seen, we haven't had an instance of vandalism within Bangalore in a rejuvenated lake. I've not put sensors in non-rejuvenated lakes with no security because in no security, everything goes. I mean, even the uh, lamps and everything goes. But if there is a home guard and there are timings and, and there's a gate, usually people will not jump in um, to, to take it. Um, you can try to make it inaccessible by putting it near an island near the outlet or something so that nobody's really going to swim out into an island and, and do it. So that, that might be a way to mitigate it. Um, like I said, I've not had an instance outside of Bangalore in rural tanks, uh, you can have this issue. What we have found is though, if the community, if you take the community into confidence and explain to them, uh, you don't make the vandalism go to zero, but it does go down considerably. So what will happen is you'll probably lose a sensor every three, four years, you know, and that's most of the time it's kids or teenagers with nothing to, better to do. It's like they're a little curious and so on. So they go and do it. What we've done in the rural areas though, is we don't do it against the beer. We kind of do it a sort of in the, you know, we wait for a, when the tank is absolutely close to the driest and then put it at the, as dry point as possible. Um, and then when the lake fills again, it's not easily accessible. You actually literally have to swim and climb the pole. So these are some ways. And then, like I said, you know, take, take the community into confidence, design it so it's as safe as possible, um, and then budget for some replacements. This is the, the best I can say Thank you. in the circumstance. Yeah. Um, there are other ways that, you know, government of Andhra Pradesh does this in a very different and interesting way. They put uh, manual measurements. So what they do is they have um, a, a guy with an app Okay, um, who has to go near and actually take a picture of the thing on that day. And what they will do is they have an internal checking, the software checks that you are within some radius of that, uh, that ruler, essentially it's a ruler painted on a pole um, that, uh, that you can't fake for that day. And, and they just, in the rural areas, this is what they do. They kind of make it the job of some minor irrigation official it's a, then there's no hardware at all, right? It's just literally a painted pole. Um, and one guy's job, who's a waterman's job, is to go and do it. And he just has to take a picture with a smartphone. And uh, the software will ensure that uh, it will check that he is within that, that many meters of the, um, of the tank while the photo was taken. So it will, uh, otherwise it will reject it. So this is a, a, cl a clever way of doing a very low cost way of getting the data. You won't get continuous measurements. Um, you, but you will get at least once a week one time measurements, which is good enough if you all you care about is the time series, of, you know, a rough time series of when does it fill and empty that. Yeah. Um, so this is how bathymetry is done. It's a it's a very cheap. Uh, this uh, it's a very cheap device that we use. It's actually a fish finder that you can get off Amazon for like uh, we bring it from the US. It's like seventy dollars or something. It's nothing significant. You get on a boat, obviously wear life jackets. Needless to say. For everybody wear a life jacket, even if you think you can swim. Uh, get on a boat um, with a with a fisherman, and basically you take the depths. And then again, there's plenty of softwares online which will tell you how to contour it and how to calculate the the bathymetry. And you can get nice, pretty 3D looking things. What we are trying to do, we haven't done it yet, is to see if we can put some very simple code 
uh, there and we would be happy to lend people these these are really cheap devices sensors we'd be happy to lend any lay group that wants to do it um, so you just have to find a what a fisherman you need you need a, a smartphone with a which has you know geo uh, geolocation um, and um, yeah that's it so, so it's not difficult to do the thing is that you it's expensive and painful for large lakes like a jalkur it takes several days to do it now oh, one important thing that i'm going to say about bathymetry is if you want to do bathymetry uh, we i've put some videos on the details of doing a bathymetry um in this and link it and do read it don't just jump into the lake the lake with or without a life jacket right away because um if you're doing it you want to make sure you've got your reference level because it's obviously that if you do it over two days your lake level is going to change from one day to the next and so if you're just taking the depth you can't compare um reference levels across two days so you have to make sure that you have an absolute reference level usually the outlet weir is a good place so you want to take a particular point in the outlet weir as um, a reference point and you want to make sure that you're measuring the depth of the lake below that outlet weir uh on the day that you're on every day that you're doing the bathymetry if you can't complete the entire lake in one day and a large lake it's difficult to complete in one day so just make sure that like i said we uh, put uh, uh, there are some videos that we put and you can uh, make sure that you understand the details and the complexities of that um now obviously the problem is that if you want to do uh, a water balance for all of bangalore it's not practical for all 164 lakes i mean eventually i hope we would get a sense and citizen groups would do this and it would just be a bunch of data which is there online but if you actually look at it the different lakes and this is just to show you the relationship between lake area and lake volume which is one of the relationships that you get when you get the bathymetry that's what the shape of the lake is telling you that varies from lake to lake it's not like it's the same for every lake often what we do is we just assume an average relationship for the lakes that we have in measure um this relationship also changes over time as the lake silts up or if it's resilted and so on so it does need to be repeated over and over again we've tried a lot with doing it with satellite imagery and so on so far we've not had success for lakes like bangalore which have a lot of algae and a lot of gunk in them it's very difficult to do it um, through remote sensing may, so miss shinu yeah. that last line in your slides i'm not able to read ऑपरेटन गेट the better um i don't know why there is a oh, this is i'm sorry to do this so the other thing that we the problem is that we don't know how much water is coming from different sources and one of the things that we have to do is the same thing if you want to know for a particular lake how much is coming from storm water versus sewage and this is something we did for jaipur lake because we were able to put some instrumentation and in some of the inlets it's tricky because one of the problems in bangalore is some of the lakes like the inlets keep on shifting because it's a dynamic situation but anyway i'll show you in a minute how you can do it for each inlet but it's the same kind of principle that you have to put a stage sensor and convert the stage into flow and then measure it over time and then do some basically add up the flow rates over um the days and then that will tell you um what is how much came from the sewage inlets how much came from the sewage treatment plant and how much came from the storm water inlet and then you can get some kind of a pie chart it's not difficult to do it's just a little bit of um it, it's a little annoying but it can it's doable um then there's a matter we don't know how much evaporation and recharge and i know i'm depressing people by saying we don't know anything but that's kind of the nature of engineering i mean we just don't have enough data on everything but we can start developing these kinds of uh, water balance equations we, if we know how much is the initial level of in the tank how much is the final level we know the difference we can measure how much is came in through rainfall and then we can get the uh, evaporation and recharge and then eventually you can start constructing a water balance for a particular lake um this is what you have to do for water balance in the streams 
uh, like I said, for the inlets and outlets, um, you basically would need, um, what you do is you measure the height of um, the, the water at different sections of the stream. And then you use something called a velocity meter, a uh, 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 flow meter. This is an, a little bit of an expensive uh, instrument, but uh, again, if somebody really wants to do it, we are happy to collaborate in some way and help you with it. Um, then you take the, the velocity at different points in the stream, and then you're literally adding up the velocity times uh, the depth in each little strip, and that is giving you your, uh, your volume of flow, and then, um, oh, then you can calculate it over many periods if you know the different heights. Uh, then you can figure out that. So ideally, you want to, it's complicated, you want to develop something called a rating curve, which tells you that for different heights in the stream, how much is the velocity, because the velocity is not constant. Obviously, as the water uh, level increases, the velocity becomes faster and faster, because uh, the water, if the water is very, very low or shallow in a stream, it gets um, dragged. The friction from the ground and the rocks and the plants and stuff is very high and it's slow. But as the water level goes higher and higher, uh, there's less and less of friction because water flows easily. It's less frictionless than the ground. And so the upper layers of the water flow faster and faster and faster. So normally what happens is you develop something called a rating curve, which is what is the uh, speed with respect to different heights. And then basically you measure height because height, if you remember, is something that you can measure. Or it's just a you know one of those devices that you place in the stream, and then you can figure this. So I know this was a lot to absorb. Um, I'm just going to uh, link the videos. Yeah. Was that a question or was somebody not on mute? I think you'll do other problem. I show Hindi is Hindi. Kelsa Marput Kala. Hindi do or ke mane kelsa Mari. Um, can somebody just mute the person who is speaking? Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, so the other way that people do it is to, because we can't measure it for every single stream, and it's really difficult, see when, when it's a dry season and it's only sewage, uh, it's possible to measure uh, how much water is there. And so if you want to measure sewage inflow, it's, that's easier. If you want to measure storm water, which is how much rain water is coming, that's a much harder proposition because it's dangerous. You can't really send, I don't feel like sending any of my students or researchers into the stream when it's during heavy rains. Most of the time it rains at night and it's not safe, people might drown and so on. So often what ends up happening is we do computer, computer simulation models. It's not good, you should not do a computer simulation model without any data. Ideally, you should always back it up with data but uh, but sometimes you need to do a combination of it because you'll never get as much data because it's not always safe. There are, of course, much, much more expensive uh, equipments that are available there, uh, that you do, don't require you to go into the stream. Uh, we can't afford them personally. I can't afford them. But um, maybe someday as a community, we will have a pool of these instruments and we can afford them. So just to let you know that. Um, so once we do all of these things and we actually go and measure these things, this was some data that we took ourselves to say how much of sewage is leaving um, through each of these different valleys. And basically through the methodology I just showed you uh, earlier, we were able to get at it. It's not perfect. It has error bars, but that's what you, you have what you have. Uh, again, here are some videos which will explain how to do both of these things. How do you do stream flow measurement and how do you do with the metric uh, studies? Uh, and we link them. And if people have further questions, you can always uh, approach us offline. Okay. Um, I think we are doing okay on time. Okay. Uh, this is heavy material. So if people really want a break, then you have to let me know because I know that uh, I'm throwing a lot of information at you. Um, so like I said before, it's tricky to account for all of these internal flows. However, we can do it. And, and this is what we did a couple of years ago through, and it's just by being, by sheer doggedness, like every one of these arrows requires a different approach. Some require surveys, some require measurements, some require models, whatever, but you can, you can get there. And by doing that, you can develop these kinds of charts 
Uh, you might have seen some of these in the context of sanitation. Uh, I don't know if you've seen any of Center for Science and Environment's shit flow diagrams, but these maps are called Sankey diagrams. And they basically allow you to show where, what is coming through what uh, pathway, where is it ending up, and who's, where does it end up. So this is, for example, sources and uses. So you have this many MLD of water. Now we've taken water for the entire year. So this is uh, taken for the whole year and averaged out. Okay, 1350 MLD coming from Kaveri, another 850 entering the city. There's a whole bunch of extra water there, another 60% or 2000, uh, another you know, 1600 or so um, uh, of rainwater, which doesn't, which just enters, goes to the soil and uh, gets evaporated in people's gardens and Coven Park and Lal Bagh and all of that. So that's a big chunk. Only a fraction actually gets show, you know, runs off and shows up in, in lakes and streams that we can account for. Um, the Kaveri water goes, uh, a big chunk of the Kaveri water um, ends up going back as pipeline leakage and into groundwater. A big chunk of that recycles back. Um, the rainwater itself, bulk of it goes into stormwater drains and eventually through the lake system. Um, some, uh, some chunk of that groundwater, about you know, 15, 10, 15 percent, depending on how aggressive we are with rainwater harvesting, goes into groundwater. And then um, some part of groundwater is also pumped by BWSSB also. So if you can see some part of groundwater goes to BWSSB because in a lot of the older areas in Bangalore, there are still municipal bore wells, uh, which uh, the corporator has put for you know one slum or one small neighborhood or so on. And so BWSSB itself has, apart from the Kaveri Water ne Network, has these little uh, pipe utilities just for one or two streets. Um, and then there's a huge amount of groundwater pumping from uh, end users themselves, which is what we call self-supplied, right? Self-supplied groundwater. So all of that together then feeds domestic and um, in uh, commercial industry. And lakes is mainly um, rainwater. And then you see in the next one, you also, this is more complicated because if you break it down, then some part of what comes into lakes also comes back as uh, wastewater. So some of that industrial commercial water also goes back both as treated and untreated back into the lake system. Some of that evaporates and the bulk of it flows downstream. So when you put all of these pieces together, um, it can be done. There is no magic about it. Uh, a Sankey diagram is something, all you need to do to develop a diagram like this is um, there are standard, this is just like some Java code, but you just first need to develop the Excel spreadsheet, which says what is going from what to what. And the main thing that you need to understand is that there's a difference between a stock and a flow. So you, the amount of water that is present in Jakur Lake um, is a large quantity of water. It can be, I think it's 800,000 ml or something like that. You'll see it in a second. But uh, the vast majority of that is, is flow, is not water that is, that is getting replenished every day. So only 10 or 20 mld or whatever may enter the lake every day, but it may have a much larger capacity to hold water, right? So it's, uh, you may have 800,000 million liters, but only 20, 30, 40 MLD is entering and leaving every day. So that's the difference between a stock and a flow. And a Sankey diagram only involves flows. So we're not considering stock. So that just because I'm talking about 1,700 MLD, that's million liters per day, that is the amount of water flowing through lakes, not the amount of water that is stored in lakes. Um, I hope that distinction between a stock and a flow is clear. So this is a diagram which is only showing the flows in a particular year. Now, if you really wanted to be uh, to have fun with it, you might see how does it look like in a drought year? How does it look like in a particularly wet year? I mean, there's all kinds of other stuff you can do with it. But why I like to do this kind of a Sankey diagram, even if this particular one is hard to read, is because it makes you realize that of the 900 MLD, for example, of the 900 MLD uh, of groundwater, only some fraction of it is coming from rainwater. A big chunk of it, 600 MLD is coming from leaking pipelines. So suddenly what happens is that if you remove these leaking pipelines, then um, you're not going to get that groundwater. It doesn't mean it's a good thing for pipelines to leak, but it also means sometimes when you look at BWSSB and they say, well, if we 
uh, get all these leaking pipelines, we'll have all this extra water and we'll go and give it to, you know, Nel Mangla or we'll go and give it to somebody else or we'll give it to this new area. But actually that water is already being used. So if all of those industries and all of those apartments keep pumping, you're going to run out of groundwater right away because the groundwater was only being kept in action because there was that kind of continuous pipeline leakage into it. So like I said, I'm not endorsing pipeline leakage, but I'm saying that an understanding of the consequences of different decisions in such an interconnected system ends up being really important. Yeah. Um, I can stop for a second to get questions. Are there questions? <laughs> or have I like depressed everybody so much that everybody <laughs> is, this is too complicated. We don't want to follow it. Is this, is this uh, clear? I can't see the chat. Okay. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, Devjan. Yeah, so uh, why is not ground, groundwater, rainwater not contributing to the groundwater recharge? It does. Uh, why is so there is, a, there is a component of rainwater that goes to groundwater recharge, but, yeah, but the, it's a small amount because of paving, right? In cities, what happens is that we, as you pave, in, in, a, in, a, in a rural area, it'll be much higher because as you pave, you're soaking all of that rainwater in and some of that water will then make it to the groundwater table. But if you've paved everything over, one of the big consequences of urbanization is that you're literally physically creating a barrier for recharge. One of the reasons that rainwater harvesting laws were really pushed in cities was exactly this, that if you're going to pave to this extent, then you have to do something to counter the effects of all of that paving. And that's why we have rainwater harvesting laws for that purpose. But naturally, in a city, if everything is paved over, you're not you're going to have very little groundwater recharge. Because yes, you put a physical barrier. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, thank so, you. So then, the net net of a Sankey, a Sankey diagram like this is to say and to notice that the lakes, and this is the reason we did this larger context, the lakes then end up being a very important intermediary between the entire water and wastewater system. They're kind of the receptacles of both stormwater as well as treated and untreated wastewater. And so, um, and they contribute to groundwater recharge as well. So, so lakes are, end up being this sitting in the middle of they collect all of the floods, flood waters, they recharge groundwater, they collect all of the water and wastewater. And so they're sitting in the middle of everything. And so any interventions you want to make on water security that don't involve let's bring a ton of more water from outside, right? I mean, of course, that you can always do. You can bring Ligan Maki and Neprati and Sharavati and all of that. That is fine. But anything which involves reusing uh, water, you know, uh, reusing more of local rainwater, reusing more of wastewater, uh, doing things a little more what we call circular economy, um, uh, in a circular economy direction, involves lakes. And it involves how we manage and conceive of the role, role of lakes. So this is the relationship between lakes and water security. So hopefully, um, and then of course, uh, as we go towards the later parts of the, of the course, I've only talked about water quantity, right? And what should become clear as we go on towards the more, towards the later part of the course is that lakes also have non-water security related functions, which is recreation, biodiversity, flood control, you know, local communities may be washing, whether we like it or not, but they, for those users, they perform that function. Uh, fishing communities, livelihoods, all kinds of dependencies are there. And so there are different stakeholders who value lakes for reasons which have nothing to do with water security. And often what happens is that those visions or those um, uh, stakes that people have, have very different uh, management criteria or they require, if you wanted to manage a lake for birding, um, you might want to have the lake look very different than if you wanted the lake to be managed for flood control. So if you want to manage a lake for flood control, the logical thing is you want the lake level to drop in summer to create space for the monsoon. If you want uh, to have a lake for, if you want to, if you really value the lake for reuse, you want to actually pump that water out and use it for something, then you want to, you care about the storage part of the lake. You want the lake to be 
maximum storage. While if you care about the biodiversity, you care about lakes as recreational species, then what you want is you want a very shallow lake that's full throughout the year. And that's where you're going to get bird habitat and so on. And so often what happens is a lot of the discussions that we have are because people want different things out of the lakes. Legitimate, all of them are legitimate kind of claims. Of, and how we decide whose claim is more legitimate is an entirely different story. But each of those different things have different water quality um, parameters that they need to satisfy and different water quantity parameters. So what happens is, and I'll talk a little bit about this later in the talk as well, that often there's a difference between us agreeing on if I do X, Y will happen, which is a purely kind of factual claim versus I want this, this is my dream and vision versus this is your dream and vision. And we actually have different dreams and visions. And so often when we are saying this is better than that, sometimes we have the same goal. We just disagree on what's going to work. And sometimes we have different goals and therefore we disagree on what's going to work. And I think it's important for us to at least be cognizant because sometimes if you recognize that, there are ways to find compromises. But instead what happens is then people get into this, okay, that person is stupid or I have greater authority than you and that sort of thing. And the conversation devolves into this very shallow kind of conversation. So it's just something for us to keep in mind. Um, now, moving finally onto the second set of topics, which is what are the different paradigms by which we can uh, conceive of water management? So the conventional paradigm, as I said, um, and that is the way our institutions today have been defined and designed, is a separation between the water wastewater system, which is the pipes um, and sewers and sewage treatment plants and water treatment plants, and the stormwater and environmental system. And you know that there's a clear um, demarcation of the agencies involved. The first is WSSP, the second tends to be BBMP or BDA, uh, depending on the local part of the city. And then groundwater is nobody's baby, even though we have um, a groundwater management act and so on. Um, it's not any, nobody cares. It's, it's just there. So, uh, so we have, this is the way we conventionally talked about it. The city hasn't evolved, unfortunately, because of the way the city has evolved. We live in a future, if we live in a, um, a reality where these now intersect. And even if we treat What happened? Okay. Hello? We can hear you. Oh, okay. Something happened. Um, somebody, one of the hosts dropped out. Never mind. So at least we can have, um, even if we have lakeside sewage treatment plants and so on, you're still going to have an interaction between the water wastewater system and the um, uh, lake system. And Often some of those conflicts that come is because the goals of the agencies and the way they have set what their job is in this entire thing is very different, right? Where um, the uh, BDA, BBMP kind of, if they think of their job as flood control, they're going to define it as get the water the heck out of here as quickly as possible. If it's BWSSB, they might say, well, let's have some water in lakes and groundwater. Maybe we can use it as a backup, uh, backstop, you know, water in a drought or something. But often those, because of the way we've separated them, the way we've conceived them, they end up being different. And often the regulations that then underpin what they are supposed to do because of a historical legacy reason ends up being different. And that's the world we live in. I'm not, Veena, I'm not kind of saying it's right or wrong. This is kind of the world we live in. Veena, sorry. Now, yeah. Sorry to, uh, the slide presentation is gone. Oh, thank you for interrupting. Oops. Yes, you're right. That's what happened. Uh, Hang on a second. Huh? Oh, that's what happened when the... Yeah, please do um, let me know because what happens is when I'm speaking, I can't actually see the chat box. So definitely um, interrupt me. Yeah? Okay. Now, can somebody confirm they can see it? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. So this is the part I was talking about, the separation between water and wastewater and the stormwater and environmental system and groundwater being nobody's concern. Um, I'm just going to pause here because I think I've said everything that has to be said. You've seen these two things before, right? Okay, so what's the difference between that and, oops, and, in, and integrated urban water management is if you remember, integrate. if you look at this, 
um, integrated urban water management is this entire thing. It's saying, how do we start managing the system for this entire reality which exists, recognizing that those four components, pipe water, groundwater, rainwater, and um, wastewater are all going to exist in cities. And we need to co-manage for the entire thing. So we need to have a unified management plan, which includes all those components. Um, in, uh, and I said, just to show you back the contrast, this is kind of the conventional paradigm that generally BBMP or, uh, is managing for some modern floods and then BWSSB is managing for this. And so that's what's causing the disconnect between uh, the integrated urban water management paradigm, which says this is the reality, manage for everything, versus continue to manage these as if each one pretends like the other one doesn't exist. Okay. Um, there are, of course, a lot of alternative ways of looking at this entire uh, system. Uh, so low impact development is one of them. Uh, low impact development is a term that is used to develop, uh, describe land use planning, engineering design, and it's generally only talking about stormwater runoff. Now, if you remember, um, the objective of current stormwater runoff, and even if you look at CPEHO's stormwater management um, uh, uh, guideline book, uh, manual, sorry, stormwater man management manual, it's really put concrete in everything so that you can get the stormwater the heck out of the city, right? And it's certainly a, a manual that was written for a particular time for a particular purpose. Um, just to, the reason I'm bringing this up is one of the things that we have, as a group have struggled with, and it's something that we encounter in dealing with it is that sometimes our regulations are either inconsistent with each other or they might be out of step with uh, some goals that we might have. It's important for us to realize what is on paper and what uh, agencies are supposed to adhere to today, even as we kind of question and say, how can we create and push for new paradigms? And these are two different realities that we have to deal with. So if the the contractors have to kind of be compliant with what is on paper today. That's kind of what they have to be compliant with. There may be alternative paradigms that other countries have tried, which may not be consistent with that. And that's a separate part of the entire equation. So low impact development is kind of uh, uh, well developed in, in the US and Canada. And uh, part of the reason that it started uh, emerging was partly because of climate change, because what happens in those countries is that, and it'll, it'll happen increasingly in India as well, is that they develop the traditional stormwater systems. You know, they develop their big uh, pipes, stormwater drains to get the water out of the city as quickly as possible. And they design them for what used to be called a 100 year storm and a 200 year storm and so on. And what happened is that because of climate change and because of increase in those countries, increased snow melt and earlier snow melt, they started having the ratio of storm to rain, uh, snow to rain changing and so on you started having much, much more massive floods, which your stormwater systems were no longer designed to do. At that point, they started asking the question, well, uh, do we have to design a stormwater uh, runoff system to always take away the water as quickly as possible? Or can we actually uh, use a stormwater system and design it in a way that will actually um, retain a greater portion of it, as well as improve water quality? So there's both the quality as well as as a, a flood control aspect to it. And it includes a whole range of specific measures. So it involves, uh, it might involve, you know, having uh, landscapes like this, which are kind of rocky and green spaces, which are permeable spaces. It might involve converting your parking lots into uh, permeable spaces, a whole range of these different um, uh, specific, um, yeah, somebody raised a hand, just go ahead and ask a question. It's somebody called iPhone. I mean, somebody whose thing says iPhone. No? Okay. Um, maybe it was done accidentally. Fine. So one, one of the things with the these kind of things then is the difference between these uh, low impact development approaches versus you know having standardized manuals and so on. Is there's a lot of site specificity to them. So in a sense, you're not saying that uh, all stormwater drains shall design for a 100-year storm. You're saying that for this particular sub-watershed, this much is the amount of rain being generated. This is the amount of the current stormwater system. Uh, therefore, we need to have so much increased absorption of excess rainwater so that 
or to you know to take to account for the increased frequency and intensity of flooding and then you say this is the amount the quality of the water therefore we need to get rid of so much level of nutrients and then we say okay this is the amount of area i need to convert and then you implement a set of practices and then you show through a simulation model um, and data that that actually functions um, to meet both your uh, water quality and water quantity goals needless to say none of this is what we are doing in india right we are barely i mean half our highways don't even have storm water drains which is why we see that when it rains like in all of our flyovers you just have water hanging around uh, below them and so this idea that we'll move away from standardized construction to much more custom development is a um, is a much less likely for a bangalore as a state but there's no reason why corporate campuses and private apartment complexes and so on can't incorporate some of these elements to it so there are there's place for it it's much less likely to happen on public land uh, than on it but it could still happen on private land um the next term that you might hear is water sensitive urban design uh, and water sensitive urban design basically integrates the way i see it and if naresh is here maybe he can talk about a different way of looking at it but the way i see it it brings the engineers and the uh, landscape architects together uh, because if you think about iuwm integrated urban water management that is kind of the engineers dream it's basically saying how do we do all of these it's lots of calculations uh, how do we kind of design you know sewer storm sizes and piping networks and worry about pressure and all of the, how much storage you have and so on and that's kind of what integrated urban water management is and then what is sensitive urban design is really and the landscape architects are often really are the ones who have the kind of vision that naresh uh, narsimhan presented earlier which is to show you know the the waterfront developments and how do you bring in ecological uh, restoration and how do you create green corridors and you know really about lifestyle and aesthetic appeal and recreational appeal and so on um what i have found is that and uh, my experience with this in india is unfortunately there isn't enough conversation between the engineering community and the landscape architecture community because when i've seen other cities present their visions of this of their waterfront developments and so on often when you look at their sewage plan their sewage plan is not consistent with that landscape architecture plan because this if you go and talk to the sewage guy he is still planning to have kind of his outlets in some place and then you ask them well what where's the water for the waterfront going to come from and as i understand this is the issue that people have with a lot of the sabarmati and some of those things is it often is coming from a pristine dam somewhere so instead of saying let's use my wastewater and water in very very clever ways develop a blue green infrastructure plan which actually has accounted for water quality quantity sewage outflow where in my location of sewage treatment plants and all of that often in many cities they take the easy way out and say let's just do the water plan development but the what if you ask where is the water coming from it's coming from some some dam i mean why would you take because it's because they are looking at it as purely a commercial um real estate venture and uh, what i see what a sensitive urban design is really being able to integrate those two which is to say how do we actually reuse all of the water and wastewater create the right standards all of that but also incorporate the design uh, architecture aesthetics recreation all of that um so this is my understanding i'm happy to be corrected if i'm wrong um the last little bit that i thought which is worth people just googling about is uh, the room for the river program um and this is more of about flood control uh, it's difficult to justify in an indian context but i still think that it's worth putting there for people to think about some of these elements and how some of these elements can be brought into uh, our indian context as well so the room for the river program was a program that was developed in the netherlands and it was basically to deal with increased flooding but uh, traditionally the way people deal with flooding is by putting embankments and you put embankments that means you have the river it carries the flood water and then you basically put two big walls next to it so that the water is flood waters are contained within the embankments of course given our indian context and given firstly with climate change the increasing frequency and intensity of floods on one hand but also poor construction on the other hand and as you've seen with all of these floods that we've seen in you know assam and bihar and so on uh, 90% of the time it's because of embankment failure and because you just didn't build the embankment strong enough um for whatever to meet whatever design criteria you needed so one of the ways that uh, this dutch room for the river program conceives of it is to say look rivers are going to flood 
but if we leave spaces for them and it could be that you're leaving public parks you're leaving you're creating the playgrounds or whatever or spaces that you don't mind flooding uh, which will not cause a lot of damage along the river so that you're kind of predicting where the flooding is going to happen and kind of allowing the flood waters to um, to spill over into certain areas uh, that is then uh, you're controlling the flooding in that way rather than trying to route it as quickly as possible away from the city and this is an issue that we face even in bangalore right even last week um, there was an announcement saying why don't we put sluice gates in our um, in our lakes but i think it's still a question of you know is there enough space in the rajkalways to route i haven't seen any of those simulations or any of those numbers and so it's very hard then to say okay if you put sluice gates it's going to solve the flooding problem because maybe the problem was that your rajkalway downstream was blocked and didn't have enough space and you narrowed it too much so we don't know where the road uh, the bottlenecks in the system are so uh, it's worth us thinking about some of the alternative ways of saying rather than let's route the water out of the city as quickly as possible is there places that you can hold the water maybe in uh, playgrounds maybe in whatever where you're actively uh, ensuring that you're creating space for flood waters um now we've come to kind of the last section of this particular um uh, session which is on how do we ultimately make choice um and i think that the main thing that i wanted to talk about here is something that i've been okay, there's lots of messages in the chat so let me just see what's going on right now Oops. Okay, Spun, somebody said Spun City. Uh, before we go down, that's a good, let me just look at what was written. Uh, recharge wells, yes. So somebody said, well, what about recharge wells? Excellent, yes, recharge wells are an important uh, part of being a Spun City. Somebody else used the word Spun City. That's also an excellent term. Basically says that you want to capture the flood water in a very um, uh, structured way or a deliberate way so that it's available for use during uh, drier periods. Um, the only thing I would say about recharge wells is often because we have a hard rock aquifer system in Bangalore, um, the rate at which putting or you are supposed to put that. Okay, somebody needs to mute again. Uh, because we have a hard rock aquifer system in uh, Bangalore, uh, often what happens is that just because you're sticking the water into the ground, it doesn't mean that you're able to. Uh, uh, you're still constrained by the rate at which the water will flow into the uh, aquifer system and flow out of your uh, your recharge pit. And so often what happens is you still do need to have some surface space to temporarily at least hold the water so that you can um, allow it to drain out. Uh, it's probably just wells alone will probably not be enough to um, to route the water out at the speed that you need because of the kind of aquifer system we have. Yeah, I think I've taken account of everything. Somebody said share the screen, water exploitation is not considered. Yes, I, I think I mentioned slides at one. So sorry about that. Borders feel okay. So somebody did say that birding doesn't birders don't only want the water to be full throughout the year and reduction is, is also re uh, welcome by them. That was just an example, just to say that sometimes the different objectives are at conflict with each other. Um, open wells, yes, absolutely. Open wells are, and open wells are a much better, so they do solve this issue. Um, uh, I think open wells are an excellent idea. We need many more of them. Whether you can get, because of Bangalore's land constraints, whether you can get enough of open wells to route the volumes of water that we are talking about still remains. So I think all of these need to be part of the system. Open wells need to be part of the system, but probably in a genuine flood, I don't know that open wells are going to take away your flood peak. What they can, so you still probably need some uh, temporary spaces where you can hold the water and then uh, allow it to recharge. You're not probably going to, maybe I'm wrong, maybe, I, maybe it's a calculation worth doing. Um, yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, I think everybody that's answered most of the questions. So, I think when we come finally to decision making frameworks, one of the concepts 
that I wanted to emphasize, which I think I've, I've, I have mentioned throughout my presentation, is what in the academic world we call the difference between the descriptive and the normative. Okay, and I know those sounds terrible, they sound terribly daunting, those two terms, but a descriptive statement is basically a factual statement. It's basically saying something that you can ind independently verify, right? If you say groundwater recharge is 26 mm per year, we may disagree. Two engineers may say, no, it's not 26, it's 35 or it's zero or whatever, but at least it's based on, on measurements and so on. But uh, if you say lakes are connected through Rajkalways, or this Rajkalway is five meters wide, all of these are statements of fact, which theoretically we can come up with a scientific measurement paradigm and we can settle through the science, if you want to use that term. Values-based statements are statements which are not statements that we can settle. So suppose you say that poor people should have free water. That is a value. And if somebody else says that, no, everybody should pay, pay their fair share of water. These are two different values. And so often it's difficult to... Uh, you may not be able to ultimately reconcile values because uh, some people may say that I like very manicured landscapes. Other people may say, no, I like my landscapes to be wild. Other people say, no, in wild, lands wild, wild landscapes, you have snakes and lizards, and I really don't like those. So these are differences in values, which you, that they are not ultimately easy to uh, reconcile, but I feel that recognizing where differences arise from differences in values versus differences arising from differences in facts are really important because often ultimately any decision making that we do is going to require a combination of both facts and values. You're going to require both descriptive and normative uh, decisions. And, and so therefore, if we understand that if you're deferring dif dif because um, the difference is because we, are, we don't think uh, the same thing is going to happen, we can go to an expert and you can ask the expert. We can go to three experts. The experts also might sometimes disagree, but at least they're disagreeing about facts. What happens in Bangalore's lake debate, in my observation, is that these things get awfully confused. You find people making statements like, in my opinion, lake should be left, in my professional academic opinion, lake should be left natural. Um, I don't consider that to be a scientific statement. I consider it to be that if you have a value for biodiversity, then this kind of landform or this kind of uh, construction or this kind of architecture is a better choice. But also recognizing that other people like, in my opinion, really ugly landscapes. Uh, but I see it. I mean, next to my house, there's a lake and I consider that uh, the ugliest landscape I ever saw, but I know that it was done very sincerely by a bunch of uh, lake residents who really, really thought that's how it should look. And that's fine. I mean, they got together and they, uh, they decided to do it. And I may not agree for a variety of reasons, but it's a difference in aesthetic, what we consider to be aesthetic. Um, so therefore, the, the, one of the questions that Nagesh had given me in my first uh, in my brief of the questions to ask is therefore how do you ensure water security for all and the first thing that i would say is that the term water security for all itself um, involves a lot of value judgments because how much what water per in liters per capita per day is enough now there are government norms in this right and government norm may say 135 for a sewer city or whatever but a lot of households and a non-trivial number of households uh, use well above that and then the question is, well, what if they're using the extra for gardens, which are uh, then keeping pollinators and birds in place? Then is it okay for them to use it? How do you answer those questions? And I don't think there are easy answers other than for us to struggle through some of these. Um, if you say, no, 135 is too much, you have to get to 100 and, 100, and the vast majority of the population disagrees with you, then you, know, you can say it till you're blue in the face, but they're just going to keep voting in place governments that are going to allow them to get 135. And so some of these are, but I feel stating those value judgments and options out clearly often really helps. Because if you say, look, often one of the ways that people have framed it is don't say it in terms of water, water in liters per capita per day. Say it in terms of what comfort you want. Um, one of the arguments I had with my own family, is somebody said, well, I want to be comfortable. Why are you taking away my you know, comfort? And I said, no, these are not two uh, you know, contradictory um, terms because you can still have the same level of comfort, what is called water service 
um, without actually using that much water if you have this technology or you have that and it will you will not even notice the difference for your lifestyle but uh, it would use a lot less water and then a lot of people say okay in that case i might be okay with it so often come uh, this comes back to those differences between making sure that we really really peel those um, differences between facts and values and 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 try to find because only through there are we going to be able to find middle middle ground we're never going to keep everyone happy that's the truth because then you have 10 million people have 10 million opinions and we're not going to keep everyone happy but the goal of this class is to some extent give people reasonable standards at least get the science right at least understand what the guidelines and the law of the land is on the paper is on paper and if you disagree with the law of the land there are other venues in which to pursue that um not necessarily fighting in a lay group because you're fighting with somebody who has to then be compliant with the law of the land so there are ways so what we are trying to do is to create a, a population that will be able to argue in a more nuanced way so similarly if we say should everybody get water free should it be affordable who is all when we say water security for all suppose i had 15 new villages do they immediately have the same rights as central bangalore even if the infrastructure currently is different do they have to reach the levels of central bangalore within 15 years you know what is that do they forever because they developed later uh, they have the advantage of newer technology and therefore they should uh, be set at a lower standard how do we determine these things and you're never going to get answers for this so one example is if you just look at the 2011 census on where pipe supply uh, is uh, supply kaveri supply you can see that the vast majority of central bangalore gets kaveri supply very few of the suburbs get it and of course some of this has changed as the additional stages came on but still as we've added and we, bangalore itself has grown this basic difference between core and periphery doesn't change and so basically it is you know who's what is security are we talking about is it everybody's or should we not think of bangalore as being one unit at all and should it be uh, uh, you know 15 uh, smaller cities of 1 million each and not one one city of 10 million and each of them can set their own um, norms and their own criteria and so on so how do we think about these things similarly who is all and as i said there is a very skewed distribution in terms of uh, water consumption the mean is 120 but the median that means 50% of the population consumes below 85 mpcd now this is based on analysis but that my colleague sharad nele did uh, as well as my colleague apurva or uh, using bwssb's billing data now uh, of course you might argue that this is not all of the data because all of, maybe all these people below 50 are pumping their groundwater wells and you know enjoying actually 200 and so one of the problems is that even with data like this um we don't know whether uh, the true median is 85 or the true median is really 135 and maybe a bunch of people are recycling wastewater or using groundwater or harvesting rainwater doing all kinds of things so their actual consumption is much higher even though their kaveri supply consumption is low so i think there's a i don't know the answer to that i haven't we haven't got comprehensive data because groundwater is not metered we can only guess how much groundwater people are using uh, and so um, we would ideally like to continue you know some of these conversations but just to give you a sense of what what kinds of debates come up in these now when it comes to what you actually do to increase bangalore's water supply there's a whole uh, suite of options uh, that you might have seen in the newspaper so one option is what in the te technical terms is called supply augmentation that means you bring new water from outside right lingan makhi nitravati hemavati sharavati all of those projects that you read about basically it's like i can't deal with it let's get water from some far away place and typically that's what supply augmentation is then increasing pricing is another way because if you say you increase pricing people would then consume less and there's a whole range of behavioral interventions that you can think about not just pricing but um, you know giving people a sense of how much where they stand relative to their neighbors in the bill very interesting thesis uh, from an iim student that i'm uh, just looking at at the moment very nicely uh, shows the evidence of um, these kinds of behavioral interventions and they, that people are able to have long term and sustainable sustained reductions in um, uh, water consumption when you adopt some of these behavioral and pricing interventions then leakage reduction now leakage reduction is a tricky one uh, because on one hand it seems insane that you would bring water from kaveri pump clean it 
purify it to drinking water standard and then send it through a leaky pipe system where it gets contaminated. Let it leak into the ground and then pump it out as groundwater and then treat it again. That's a pretty crazy thing from a energy uh, and from any economic standpoint. However, and therefore leakage reduction does, should be done up to a point. Uh, leakage, uh, cities love re leakage reduction programs because there's a lot of digging contracts involved. Everybody is happy, politicians are happy, utilities are happy, everybody is happy with leakage reduction uh, contracts. The problem is that leakage reduction doesn't create new water. It, it takes away some of that groundwater that was being pumped. It still should be done, but up to a point, and it should be done in a planned manner, rather than every day somebody gets a contract to do leak reduction and then you know dig up the thing and a road which was just wiped off. Just yesterday, somebody was telling me that the white topped road in front of their house was, was dug up. So uh, something to think about in terms of how far do you go uh, to reduce leaks. You ideally want to create one of the more technical issues with leakage reduction has to do with the way our pipe supply system is managed and the fact that it's intermittent and the, there are pressure issues, all kinds of things. There are a lot of technical issues there, but just as a general public to think about, it's not, um, I would say that it's not a, it's not a, it's not a silver bullet that just because you leak, re reduce leaks, everything got solved, right? Because if you remember from that complicated Sankey diagram, some of your groundwater recharge would have gone away. Um, and so you do want to re reduce leakage only because it's a sane choice, but only up to a point. Groundwater metering is something that we absolutely need to do right now. All of our, you saw that a big, big, big fraction of our city's water comes from groundwater. And it's because groundwater is free for all. We haven't figured it out. Um, I think that there are a lot of interesting innovations that can be done if there are people here who are young on the IT tech side. Let's absolutely let's talk about it. There's really innovative stuff that can be done there. Similarly, with wastewater recycling, we're really interested in seeing how we can do better with wastewater and rainwater. There's a lot of very interesting cutting edge um, uh, options to recover energy from wastewater, make it more cost effective. Uh, I really think that if I had to put my money as an investor, if I was a water investor and I had to put my money in one thing, I would put it on wastewater recycling because that's kind of where all the exciting uh, developments are happening and really lots of exciting stuff. And then rainwater harvesting, of course, makes sense. It basically, um, I'll look at the... Um, Wastewater, so rainwater harvesting makes sense. It's cheap, but it's uh, it's also hard for um, uh, cities to implement and enforce. So um, yeah, there was a talk about uh, there's a question about our water lines and sewage lines map. No, we are not. I think Harish Narasimhan talk about fluid fluid ro robotics, and I'm really hoping that companies like Fluid Robotics are able to help us get there. Some of the things is. Some of the reasons are that um, these are legacy systems where they started off with a historical system, which they didn't map. And then people kept just adding random, you know, in our Indian Jugaad style, adding uh, pieces to it. And now nobody knows where anything is. So, and then if it's a builder who wants to secretly release sewage to a drain, as you can imagine, the builder has no incentive to go and announce and say, here's where I'm putting it. So it's a complicated thing because of that. And um, I agree, it's something that we should be investing in. Um, yeah, this is just what I wanted to say about plug the leaks. I mean, it's on one hand, people would say it's obvious, but um, once, once you put the entire system together, including wastewater, including stormwater, um, I would say because it's an integrated system, it's important for us to be able to uh, connect these pieces and say, if I'm taking water out of this bucket and I'm putting it there, what's the consequences of that going to be? And we've done these exercises and it does show that integrated urban water management makes a lot of sense for a lot of reasons. Um, it's just that I would say one of the problems that we as a city do, which nobody in the Western world, anywhere in the Western world would approach Kind of infrastructure projects the way we approach it without having serious numbers and even if they are ballpark estimates but at least you would have justifications and some calculations done but then normally you would do serious simulation models i don't know why in india we don't do simulations in our serious simulation scenarios of saying what's the implication of an 800 crore project i mean um if any of you attended the belandur lake seminar on monday 
uh, that Nama Bangalore Foundation um, uh, organized. Basically, it comes to that you started an 800 crore project without knowing what the consequences of something would be. And often it takes only eight crores or 1% of the project to develop some of these scenarios and kind of think through them ahead of time. But we don't have a culture of doing that. And therefore you do it and then we are like, oops, and then we spend another 800 crores fixing it. And so often uh, there's a saying in the water sector, which is spend the millions to save the billions. And I think that that is something that's basically my point here. I'm not trying to, um, I, I'm not trying to push one solution or another. I do think ultimately that is something that we as a society will jointly have to do. But I am trying to say that we can do it more sensibly with a little more planning and a little more numbers put in before we go and spend the 800 crores. Um, now, ultimately, when we, if you remember in terms of the values and so on that we talked about, uh, this is just some random uh, numbers that I, I mean, I, just a random figure that I put up. But often this is what we do in multi-criteria decision making because all of us want the poor to not be hurt. All of us want lakes to be full. All of us want the benefit cost ratio of a project to be greater than one. All of us want BWSSB to be financially healthy. Often these different options don't all work out. Uh, you know, different, one option might have one set, another option may have another set. Sometimes a combination of two options can be better for in, in terms of everything. But the problem is that we never put these things out like this in the public domain. And that is one of the problems that we as a, we struggle with. Okay, so um, that's kind of the conclusion of my presentation. I can take uh, more questions. I know this was a long and tiring session. Uh, the main takeaway message for us is we have a current conception of Bangalore's water system, which is kind of a, a fragmented system with BWSSB looking at water and wastewater, BD and BW, 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 BWMP looking at stormwater and lakes for most part. Um, the system is physically integrated and that is the reality of it. And so if we want to manage that physically integrated system, we do have to look at it and also want to take account of the fact that we want the lakes to contribute to water security um, as opposed to uh, only getting water from more and more and more distant sources, then we do need to look at it in a holistic manner. If you want to look at it in a holistic manner, it is complicated. There are many things that we don't know, but before we spend a ton of money on infrastructure projects, or even alongside that, we want to be able to do some of these basic calculations and plans and put these numbers out so that we can have a little bit more of a nuance debate. And finally, to understand that eventually when it comes to decision making, there is no such thing as the numbers giving you the answer. There's always going to be differences in values and opinions which can't be resolved. That's what we have a political process for. But at least if we make them transparent and say that these options are going to benefit these stakeholders and those options benefit those, here are ways to reconcile those, then at least we have ways of moving forward rather than spending money and then nobody's happy.